I've come today to the region of the Galilee. Off in the distance, you can see Mount Tabor. That's traditionally the site where the transfiguration of Jesus was thought to take place. What an event for cancer patients to contemplate. Today, we look down into the valley and see all those houses in the city below. And we stop and think behind every single one of those doors and windows, there's a human story. In most cases, it's probably a story of both hurt and hope, of looking for goodness and love. And that's our phrase for today. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. Stop and think of it. It's another one of those jolters. In fact, it's almost outrageous. Who has the right to predict something like that? Shouldn't David have had the modesty to say, maybe goodness and love, or I hope goodness of love and love, but no, he states it as a certainty. Now, our first inclination might be to say, well, a wealthy king like David can say something like this. After all, he had all kinds of people fawning all over him. He was the equivalent of a big time celebrity and a rock star. Remember, one of David's nicknames was the singer of Israel. And as a young man, he was a military legend. So much so, in fact, that popular songs were written about him. The girls were singing in the streets. Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. So maybe it was easy for him to say, surely goodness and love will follow me. But we better not be too quick here. The truth may be much different. David too knew periods of despondency that look so much like what we would today call depression. We have the evidence in the Psalms. In Psalm 13, he agonizes, How long, O Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? And then there are the words in Psalm 22, words so powerful that Jesus even made them his own when he cried out on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? David knew all about emotional turmoil, danger and distress. Remember, he lived in hiding for years as a fugitive. As king, he had a son who led a rebellion to overthrow him. One of his key advisors betrayed him. Three of his sons died young. One of his sons raped one of his daughters. Another son killed his brother. Quite a family, huh? We could go on. I'm sure you get the point. We better be careful to see what our verse really says. It doesn't say we will be spared heartache, trouble, and pain, but it does affirm that in the long run, things will turn out and even good can emerge from the pain. No matter how hopeless things may appear, one day we'll see how God worked things together for good. Now, many people who get diagnosed with advanced cancer, surprisingly, actually come to say, cancer is the best thing that ever happened to me. They call it their wake-up call and they say that the blessings far outweigh the pain. I can personally say that the three and a half years since I got my diagnosis have been good years. And I'd have to say even in some ways, my best years. It's because I savor each day so much more. I treasure family and friends I used to take for granted. And it's good not to have to prove anything to anyone. Right now, all I need to do is discern, what does God want me to do? And then do it joyfully. I know a young man whose cancer has severely limited his life, but he refuses to despair. He puts it this way, my glass is not half empty, it's half full. And it's not only half full, it tastes great. One day, I woke up dreaming about going back to the time before I had cancer. And then I realized I did not have to give cancer more than it's due. 
because Kansch is like a wicked thief that broke into my house to find money, jewelry, and other valuables. But that thief misses so much. My books, my pictures, my written journals in which I preserve cherished reflections, these the thief leaves untouched. They're some of the most precious valuables. And I came to realize there are things in life that cancer simply cannot reach. Maybe it can ravage the body, but it has no claim on the soul. And this is the place I'd like to say how appreciative I am for a man who showed me that goodness and love does follow us. He could have looked at things differently. He could have become very bitter. His uncle had saved up to put him through college, but as a youth, he thought he knew it all. He left school when he was 14 and later went back to school nights and self-educated himself. He was fortunate to get a good woman for a wife, but they lost their first child, Billy, when he was only eight years old, when he got hit by a New York to Boston Express train. Then in her prime, his wife died a prolonged death from cancer. To pay for the medical bills, he got involved in a business that went broke. And then he lost a second wife to cancer, and I could go on and on. He did end up as an officer in a major corporation and did work into his mid-80s. But the setbacks that he experienced never made him cynical. Every single day of his adult life, he began on his knees, giving thanks to God. In the midst of all that life threw at him, he still knew and found that goodness and love followed him. And I know this is all true because that man was my father. This psalm reminds us that we too can find goodness and love following us. And the reason for that is we can know where we're going. There's a destination and the joy begins in the anticipation. And that destination is the subject we'll take up next time when we look at the words, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Mm -hmm.